Hello and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with I, your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 515. That's 515 of the Agassino Zynga show with I, your host Agassino Zynga. I hope you're doing well wherever this show may meet you. If it's your first time checking out the show via YouTube, you know what to do. Smash like, hit subscribe, leave me a comment down below. That'd be greatly, greatly appreciated. If, of course, you're listening via the podcast, that leave me a 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 star review. Don't care which one it is, just leave some review acknowledgement that you enjoy what you're hearing. Um, it brings you some kind of value and all that good stuff. And, of course, support for your patrons. Welcome to. You're going to be uploading a new patron episode by the end of the week, focusing on some of the more let's say x-rated stuff that happened on my trip recently to berlin so if you want to find that then definitely check out patreon.com for us agostino that's patreon.com for us a g o s t i n h o you can find that link in the description click on there only one dollar per month get access to all my patreon exclusive content as well as this x-rated berlin review coming at you very soon so jump on there that'd be greatly appreciated but yeah here we are back again on the main show actually the show episode number 515 hope you are well wherever you may be as you can tell i'm good i'm kind of like fresh off of what what am i fresh off of what i'm fresh off a plane fresh off a trip not that not feeling that fresh to be completely honest you know if you know you know not feeling the freshest but you know i'm getting there i'm getting to where i need to be i'm getting to where i need to be but what's been going on recently not much really in it gonna recap obviously some stuff happened to me where i was away of for obviously for the week got some obviously some distressing news to obviously cover as well in terms of stuff that's been going on during that time as well as some other in between pieces but you know first things first this really hasn't been so surprising to see that man united the team that i support have not made any change when it comes to the managerial position or the coaches um you know we're on a very bad run of form it looks like right now most of the fan base has finally come to realization that maybe Oli isn't a guy i've been screaming this from for maybe what two years now it was fairly evident after the interim process especially towards the end of the interim process that he probably shouldn't have been given the full-time job he was a great sort of in-between person to have after Mourinho's sort of toxic tenure you needed to have somebody who was kind of pally pally you know and just kind of happy-go-lucky willing to poise arm around the players willing to kind of restore some sort of pride in the club or whatever it may be with the fan base whatever um or you know Mourinho kind of turned us against each other turned us against the club he wasn't really with the club so you needed somebody like him he did do well in that respect but it was never really a smart strategic or long-term approach to ever give somebody like an Oli a long-term contract especially not the extension I think fair enough if you want to say you gambled and you went to give him the three-year deal after he did well at the interim stage because of what he did during the interim stage even though the end of it wasn't that great okay but whatever fair enough but then to give him a contract extension that I think he only signed in July was just for me criminal I didn't get the thinking behind it I didn't know why they did it um, if anything it was probably an admittance from them at that point that they didn't really have any clear plan in place as to where they wanted to go but it was kind of working with Oli so why not just continue on and now we're in a position where now it's gotten worse than they've probably ever imagined and with no plan it still makes sense for them to kind of stick with them even though it's enraging us it makes sense for them at the moment to stick with him because they never had a plan of removing him from his position in the first place and now that we're in a position now they don't want to you know kind of go into it they don't want to do a knee-jerk reaction and kind of get somebody else um especially if the knee-jerk reaction was antonio conte who is essentially to them um a ptsd or a nightmare waiting to happen in terms of him basically being a carbon copy in terms of attitude wise in terms of demands of people like van gaal and Mourinho, who they obviously didn't vibe with too well so you know they've seen them they've seen a model of coach they want it's not only going to social it's someone that's very malleable someone that's very passive somebody that's just more happy to have the job than he is willing to kind of push forward in terms of trying to make the club as successful as possible that's what you see a lot with the top managers even though Oli's being quite arrogant in, in a sense that he doesn't want to walk away from the role and he just wants to kind of he still thinks he can turn it around there's another level of arrogance with managers where they're sort of like Mourinho does this a lot where when things start to go wrong with the club when he starts to get bad results he wants it to be known that he's doing his job, but someone else isn't doing theirs, whether it's the players, whether it's the owners, right? And top managers have that. They have that kind of, no, I just, FYI, I'm not willing to take all this slack on my own. Um, other people are going to have to share this blame and they kind of divvy out the blame as they as they choose. But when you're a manager like Oli and you've kind of got his track record or you've got his kind of, you know, CV, 
it makes sense why you're going to be a little bit, you're going to be a little bit more passive you're going to be a little bit more malleable you're going to be a little bit more agreeable um not or yeah disagree i, I guess whatever it may be yeah uh, you're going to be a bit of a walkover because essentially man united job is basically the big job it's ever going to get i very much doubt which is why the contract extension didn't make no sense. I very much doubt he's going to get another job at a top club. I don't think he is. He probably can get another job in the top 10 Premier League club, let's be honest. Um, these top 10 Premier League clubs don't always go out for the best coaches out there. Um, they usually do have a bit of a patchy, inconsistent record of hiring coaches. And sometimes they just panic because you want someone to be in charge just so they don't have an open vacancy there for too long. And they really can't afford it really because you never know, you know, how far you can drop down a table with an interim manager if you're that kind of level of, um, you know, team. So he can still get there. But in terms of getting a job in, for another Champions League side, I just don't think that's going to happen. He's, he's shown no real acumen or no real ability to kind of operate on that level. And I also don't think he's going to succeed at the lower levels. I just don't think he's got that in him. Um, you know, some managers are really good at kind of succeeding at that kind of lower band of teams and bringing them up. But can you really see Ole Gunnar Solskjaer taking a team from League One to Championship or Championship to the Premier League? I can't. Um, so, and that's going to be what he needs to do. He's going to need to do what David Moyes did after he left United, right? Left United in disgrace after nine months. Rose Sosedad, I think he went to Sunderland, then Everton. I think Sunderland and back to Everton, then West Ham, West Ham. I'm not too sure. Is that how it worked out? One of those kind of marks, right? But he had two really bad gigs after Man United. So he had to kind of restart, he had to kind of rebuild his reputation by going a little bit lower, you know, in that kind of ways and kind of working with his way up that way. And he still failed in those, like those kind of quote unquote lower clubs, Rose Sociedad and Sunderland being the two main examples. But, you know, again, no big surprise for me. I don't, I'm not really a surprise. Now the fans are always organizing a protest. They're aiming to go out on Saturday for a Glazers out, Oli out sort of protest. There's a lot of division with the fan base now because some fans are unwilling to go and protest under a banner that says they want their manager out because he's a legend, which is odd because part of me thinks also this whole infatuation people have with Oli, the fact that he was, again, a super sub, right? I, I would say he's more of a cult hero than he is a club legend, but, you know, when you score a Champions League winner, maybe you deserve to have the legend more than the care attached to you. But regardless, it just makes me wonder if people are so afraid to come out and criticize Oli because he's a club legend and they are hoping that he does well, even though there's no evidence that he's a top level coach, right? He's, he's shown no evidence so far that he's a top level coach. He's got us good results. We've been able to finish quite high up in the league. But in terms of convincing you that he's going to be able to have the tactical, um, formational nous needed for us to win European Cups and stuff, I don't really see it. He, he, he's never, ever done it. Right? He's never illustrated that. So you're just living in pure hope. It's funny that people are acting this delusional about him imagine if we had for instance Roy Keane as a manager will people be as delusional because he's, he's a bigger legend than um Ole Gunnar Solskjaer will people be as delusional as if we had Gary Neville as manager Wayne Rooney as a manager Eric Cantor as a manager you know doing this poorly like that, that's a bit that's kind of worrying me a little bit our fans are so sentimental so emotionally led that it's making me wonder that if we have another club legend in a prominent role in our in our club and they do a bad job, the fans are going to be super hesitant and reluctant to call them out because look at how well they've been treating Oli despite him having no reason, despite him having earning no right to be treated that well in a managerial sense, um, apart from what he did as a player. And it just doesn't make any sense in that regard. But again, I understand the premise. You don't want to go against a manager, protest, I get it. And some people say the, the bigger picture is the Glazers, which is obviously true. The Glazers are a big issue. We've always known that. But unfortunately for me, I feel like as much as I know, you know, small protests can help in terms of like, you know, maybe pushing a, a larger narrative or maybe pushing or being able to kind of be the catalyst little by little to like bigger, bigger levels of change. I still think at the end of the day, the Glazers are going to decide when they leave United. They're going to decide when they want to sell up. Um, they're not going to sell on the cheap. They're not going to take a penny less, a penny more. Than, they're not going to take a penny less than what they've actually valued the club at. Um, they're going to take as long as they can to ex ex fleece as much money as they can out of us. Um, all the kind of protests that we've done, green and gold, you know, Beckham wearing the flipping scarf, all these things have done nothing to change their stance on the club. I think so far, somewhere, I remember someone hearing, I forgot who said it, that in the 16 years that they've owned the club, they've spoken to the fan for a total of like 30 minutes or something like that. I think that's a total amount they've actually spoken directly to the fan base, which is absolutely wild. They don't attend many games. They take out lots of dividends. Basically, they withdraw money from the club every year without really putting much money in. Only the money the club basically generates, which it generates a lot of. Um, and it's just been a completely a complete failure of an ownership post Alex Ferguson, right? Um, without the genius manager, without the genius 
you know uh record breaking legendary record books making manager in place we've been shown up to be the inept poly run club that we've always expected we were and a lot of the fans who were hell bent on convincing themselves that transfers were the reason why we weren't a top club anymore or because of whatever have now come to the realization that no it's actually coaches it's actually what we do in the training grounds is a reflection of how we play on the weekends or during the week and also the football structure doesn't really allow for us to be successful in this modern landscape anymore you just this isn't the modern landscape of like just signing good players Real Madrid have got all the money in the world to sign who they want they're not where they need to be Barcelona are a good example of it they're not where they need to be it's not just a matter of signing players there needs to be more to it than that it demands more right these lower clubs like the Norwiches and the Aston Villas and the you know even newer newer sort of uh, forces in the Premier League like the Leicesters have proven that with an actual quality structure you can achieve really outlandish and ridiculous results you know let's obviously win in the league win in the FA Cup like they've done really well for a club that you know a lot of teams a lot of people probably didn't give a chance when they did it eventually come up to the league so all these things in you know I still think that protest is a good idea. It's going to happen on the weekend. I'm looking forward to seeing some of the pictures and footage. I'm looking forward to seeing the reaction to it. And I think in general, it's good to that everyone's kind of awoken, right? And United fans' public consciousness has basically been um, arisen and people have kind of finally gotten around to the idea that we need to you know, change our ownership or at, at the very least change our football structure. I'm still perplexed why after all these years we finally get a football director in place and the football director is somebody that's already been at the club since David Moyes here and the John Murto. Then we get Devin Fletcher to do the kind of technical director role, which again, if you're going to go best in class and you want to kind of lay a blueprint, it would make more sense to just start with a fresh external team, get them to lay the blueprint and then bring in the legends after the fact to kind of fill in the holes when needed to be. But this idea of just bringing in people who are learning on the job again, it's perplexing again who knows John Mato guy could be really good but we've seen no evidence so far in the entire tenure that he's been at the club that he's had any kind of real say or pull in what we do in terms of player acquisitions you know his name is his, his name or Dan Fletcher's name hasn't even been mentioned during the conversations around new managers getting hired so you already know where the authority lies in that respect there's news of Ed Woodward supposedly staying on until April and then maybe staying on the club as a consultant which is fucking preposterous but again what can you do so hopefully these protests do kind of stir some debate get people chatting get people talking get the fan base a bit more united or unified on the, what the actual threat is because we've all basically seen until we get the football structure in place just replacing the coach is never going to get us where we need to get to we just need to have better we need to have better football structure because better football structure will basically inform who we have as coaches anyway right basically if you have a a strong director of football in place who has a very a big vision of what we want to do as a club people like Oli probably wouldn't have a job you know what I mean that's just the long and short of it because if it doesn't match with where we want to go and how we want to play they're going to make the change and get someone else in and, and it will end up happening we won't maybe end up going for the big managers maybe we'll get a director of football in that says you know what um, given what we have and given what we're trying to do Ralph Hassan who was the best manager for this position at the moment a bit of a left field appointment someone doesn't make it like, oh my god how do you why would that make a sense but for what we got going that's basically the best option going forward do you know what I mean maybe that's good the way you go forward a bit because that's what real directors of football do they can unearth gems in terms of player recruitment and they can also unearth gems when it comes to coaches people that you might necessarily might not have heard of who are maybe you know doing some good things who can maybe come in and do a job or maybe people you know an interim manager who's got experience can come in and do a job like people are talking about that Ralph Ragnick guy coming in and doing something but all these things are put need, need to be put in place by a director of football but at the moment we don't have that so i guess it is what it is but again hoping that protest goes off for that hitch and we see a lot of positive change going forward um next what's we'll about? oh yeah cool let's just update quickly on my berlin trip as you guys know i went to berlin this weekend or not this past weekend obviously from the Thursday to the Monday um, this is what I've usually done for the best part of what six plus years um, before that I was going maybe every other year um, but since then I've been going basically every year sometimes twice mostly to go to the Bergheim obviously and Panorama Bar and visit those two legendary techno house disco and whatever clubs you want to call them well Bergheim's the main techno club and obviously Panorama Bar is more the alternative let's say disco house and everything else in between and obviously you know it's known as a legendary nightclub a club that basically sets a president or sets the kind of blueprint for what people want to do going forward in terms of the clubbing space all that good stuff you know you know the legend you know the name so 
things have changed over there right so i'm going to kind of split my review of the situation into two i'm going to split it up into the entry process and you know a review of all that stuff going forward and then i'll talk about the night itself that i went to and then we can go on to other things so entry process since pandemic has kind of changed a little bit obviously um things have kind of needed to go a bit different i think the burger only could have opened without a mask mandate anyway it's impossible if you've seen the club if you've been anywhere near it you know that it's impossible to do any sort of social dis social distancing it's impossible to have your mask on in there it just doesn't make any sense so if they were going to open they need to open with um maybe limited capacity and maybe this improved ventilation system that they've been talking about i've been hearing them saying so that was the only way they was going to go forward and then of course vaccine passports to ensure that everyone that's going in there is fully vaccinated because there's no other way because i think recently there was an outbreak there recently so you know if you just would have said people can come in who haven't been vaccinated it would have been probably even higher in a massive outbreak before so whatever so you basically have to register yourself um you basically have to make sure you have a covid vaccine basically you know to get into the club uh have your vaccine covid vaccine passport i'm obviously from the uk so i have an nhs pass which is fine to go in with i think if you read that on the website it does list in a small print that maybe it's a case-by-case -case basis about nhs passes but when you actually go to the venue itself they've got a board on the outside that kind of lays down the steps of what you need to do in order to get in and it basically clearly says in one of the brackets that you know you can basically get in with a vaccine passport from the nhs so that's pretty much easy to do you also have to bring along your id um it has to be your real id i, I didn't know but but supposedly you could bring your photocopy of your passport or a picture of it but now because obviously we're living in the pandemic times you have to bring your actual physical passport with you id so you can have it obviously have that matched up you've got to register yourself on the burgain app and you get scanned in with that also and that's basically it you spend most of your time queuing they've got a queuing system there that's pretty easy to kind of get around um to kind of understand they've got some railings that you need to get on that are obviously always there all the time and now they've got these extra railings that they put in place too that go right towards the end next to where all the kiosks are and the little kind of stands that people sell food and shit is when i went on the sunday because i think the opening weekend was crazy for those stories of people waiting seven eight hours to club and party and again i'm a big fan of the club you've seen many videos or many clips from my podcast talking about it but even myself i've got to draw the line and say there's no place i'm gonna queue for more than four hours to get into maybe even more than two it's just not worth it especially in a city like berlin there's so many other blip great places that you can go to and have a good time in why would you want to waste you know eight hours of your holiday to walk clog queue outside somewhere that you're not even guaranteed to get into once you get into the front because obviously they have a very select um door picking policy so um or very strict door picking policy so with that being said um i was happy to i was happy to i'm happy to report back that the queuing the queuing system in general has kind of decreased it's a little bit less crazy than it was before again i heard stories people queuing for eight four hours before now i've heard the most i've heard someone said the queue was maybe about three and a half maybe four hours the most but for the most part if you arrive sometime between i'm gonna say 3 a.m mm, no let's call it 4 to 8 a.m on a sunday morning you can possibly get in under two hours i only had i only had to wait half an hour no one and one and a half i arrived there at 7 a.m i got in a half eight and it was a fairly easy queue and when i got there at half seven I stood right at the back so right where the fence ends where there's that board where you get to see all the list of what you need to do to get in that's where I stood and then once uh, you know as the queue started going down it started to expand to the end but it was a fairly quick queue I'm not going to lie um, a lot of it had to do with the fact that they were turning away quite a lot of people which was again quite I don't know what it is maybe because it's a post-covid thing I think before covid I was a little bit more it's as gay to say but i took some pride in the fact that every time i went i got selected to go in but this time around waiting in the queue you know after waiting so long and it's cold and shit i kind of felt bad for the people that are getting turned away and i also kind of felt as if like the whole door selecting thing is getting a little bit you know it's getting a little bit meh in general especially nowadays you know you have to think if you're willing to make the journey over to that country especially if you don't live there um and travel and all that stuff in queue during these kind of crazy times that we're living in put yourself at risk put your family's health at risk whatever right in terms of covid and whatnot um you're obviously going there for the right reasons you're not going there just to go and fuck around so to have such a strict door policy off the back of that and during the time that we're in now it just feels it just feels a little bit insensitive it just feels a little bit tone deaf it just feels a little bit unfair it just feels like again it probably isn't and you have to maintain your standards with what you're about is what you're about you know people would say um there's a story about 
Studio 54, right? And that you, you, I think maybe that was might have been the first introduction of the Velvet Rope. I'm not too sure, right? The whole idea of an exclusive club with the select. I think that might have been. I'm not too sure if that is actually it, how the history goes. But let's just let's just imagine that it is. There is a story that says that allegedly the reason why Studio 54 ended up failing and going down a drain was because they started to become too exclusive and only catered to the select higher ups and people who they were in the club. And what actually was the main genesis of why it was so great to be in there in the first place was that they had a good mix of like regulars of like, you know, normal quote unquote average Joes and celebrities. So any day of the week, you could just see, you could be at a bar ordering a drink and there's flipping, you know, um, what's her name? Tina Turner, Michael Jackson, whatever it may be, right? Just sitting there having a drink. But then after a while, it then turned into being an exclusive celebrity only club and normal punters couldn't get in. And then when normal partners couldn't get in, that sort of started the downturn of Studio 54, which one is like complaining, loads of hassle outside, complaints to the police, fights, all this sort of stuff. Until eventually, it obviously went down a drain, I think off the back of, again, the, the, the drugs bus they did then, a few other things I forgot in the documentary. But that's the kind of story that they kind of say, right, after the fact. And you feel like sometimes when it comes to Bergheim, that's kind of how it is with there. Like, there's a lot of people that get in, for instance, the guest list queue is always quite big. Um, which makes a lot of sense because a lot of people play there are, you know, regular people like you and I. They have friends also in the industry who want to go in. So there's no, there's no selection policy at the guest list queue from what I can see. Everyone kind of gets in from the guest list. And again, they obviously make up a small minority of the club. When I looked at the guy who had the flip sheet, he was kind of flicking through like three pieces of paper. So it's not that many people. Let's not be get it confused. But there's still a different sort of selection process when it comes to guesses people they come to regular entry people so they get the benefit of the doubt because they know the people that are there but then if you're there in a the queue willing to queue for two and a half hours you should also get a benefit of the doubt because it means you're there for the right reasons right so i thought that was a bit unfair but you know it did serve my purpose in terms of allowing me to get to the front really quickly um then i was you know interrogated somewhat in terms of my uh, uh in terms of why i was there which is also gonna get left a bad taste in their mouth. Like, have you been here before? Da, da, da. Yes, of course I've been here before. Um, you know, you play that game. I was, I was, I was happy to get in and get selected, so that was fine. Once you do get in, you scan your QR code of your Bergheim pass that you got, you can download on your Apple Wallet or whatever it may be. You get the QR code. It's a fairly easy system to go through. Just go on the Bergheim site. You see the admissions thing. Click on it and go through the list of stuff. Um, please to go through. Then you get searched. Um, from what I can see, the search stations and the uh, cloakrooms were somewhat fully staffed because there was a thinking going on now around the little scene of people basically saying that the reason why they can't open later in the night or no later in monday morning supposedly it kind of closes a lot more early than it did in the past because again i wasn't there till, until the end i left before, quite before but usually it closed if i'm not mistaken monday at 7 a.m i've done that a couple of times where you stay right until the end right so you probably all the way through to from saturday all the way through to monday and i remember them saying that it was going to close and now it's closing up about 4 a.m so you know sets are not as long as they used to be and i think panorama bar maybe closes a little bit sooner than that but a lot of people are saying it's because they can't find staff, right? So they're kind of short staffed and it's been a, a big issue with um, a real lack of staff in the hospitality industry ever since the pandemic has sort of, I would say, kind of slowed down a bit and other parts of the industries have basically opened up mainly hospitality. They find it very difficult to refill those spots because people have just basically moved on. They maybe realise the money they get on benefits is, you know, more than enough to kind of sustain their new way of life that they're having now post-pandemic, wherever it may be. Who knows the reasons why? But they're just finding it hard to find people to fill those slots so because of that they're finding it hard to run at full or you know at their full capacity because they don't have the support staff needed to kind of keep that place running and you have to imagine the place is huge many many people go in there there's a big infrastructure around it that also supports it that we don't see as partners because you're just too high and drunk but there's a, probably a big infrastructure that kind of makes sure that that place is open and functioning the way it needs to be because if there's one thing you can say you don't have to wait at the bar too long the toilets are always you know fairly okay to basically piss and shit in and do whatever you need to go do in like everything is needs to, need is, everything is where it needs to be in terms of lighting all this sort of stuff it's pretty well run sort of place so a lot of that has to do with the stuff that goes on behind the scenes so without the staff they can't basically do it which i understand i get um but from what i saw the search stations were fairly fully staffed so was the ticketing kiosk and so was the cloak rooms fairly easy to get through easy no, no lemon squeezy i would say it's a lot more quieter than this than it's ever been it probably resembles 
the last time I went, which was February 2020, that was just before the pandemic happened, um, just before I was aware, you know, what was going on and so much, much of the world. And that was a fairly quiet affair too, quiet in a, in a sense that I could walk right up until the, like usually in the past when I've gone, you couldn't go from like the back of Burger King all the way into the front of the DJ booth. Like it wasn't an easy route. You sometimes had to go around um, the side where the bar is or have to go on the other side around the back of the speakers, but you couldn't go from the, the plinths and walk straight through the crowd up to the front of the DJ booth. It was impossible to do so, right? Just really hard because it was so, so packed. But this time you could do so because it wasn't as packed as it would need to be. But I'm going to say it's a far more enjoyable clubbing experience for me personally. There's, there's room to you to dance and move around. You're not always bumping into people you can sit down or you can just hang on the side and still kind of catch a vibe next to everything that's going on you can move around from room to room fairly easily because there was a time before when you'd go in there there'd be a queue to walk up to panorama bar i mean it'd be that crazy or sometimes the queue would be coming out to the toilets would be leading out to the main dance floor be just nuts 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 level so now it's a fairly now it's not as much people there but still it's the same level of kind of excitement and happiness and sort of like you know geek them i'd say hello everyone that's there is a, you can tell they're properly about this life so maybe that goes back to the door picking even though there's the people that are attending there or queuing outside they're probably fans of the place there's no point in picking them it probably still adds to the overall effect i don't know whatever it may be but i still found that to be um a fairly good good experience going forward and um, both rooms of course i need where they need to be i think i really enjoy panorama ball panorama bar more so than i did burger King this time around but again um i'd say the entry process is fairly easy to get through and all that malarkey the only thing i'd point out only if i'll point out to end queue jumpers there's so many of them now maybe more than there were previously before now a lot of people would say or i would say actually that the pro the reason there probably is a lot of crew jumpers now is because there are a lot of locals who are kind of disgruntled with how it's been handled the re the, you know the opening process and shit and maybe they feel as if that they have, they, that they shouldn't be queuing because they've been going there for years and shit da, 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 da. so there's maybe there's an entitlement in that respect but i just think in general i just think it's super rude and super disrespectful to your other ravers to just assume that your time is more important than anybody else's like you don't need to wait an hour you need to only wait half an hour and i have to wait an hour which i mean i didn't really like that and again i'm not talking about queue jumpers in terms of like you're holding you're in the queue imagine if i'm in a queue and you see me and i'm your friend jump in with me you're more than welcome to and we've seen it happen to many people but people that are just like don't have any friends just decide to walk right to the front or walk near the front i think they deserve to die you really do deserve to die. You deserve to get kicked into the ground somewhere. And I had to kind of call out a couple of people who jumped in front of me and tried to pretend that they were friends with the guy in front. They clearly weren't. So I asked them, hey, are you guys together or something? He's like, nah. Then why do you just decide to jump in? Like, why do you think my, your time is worth, worth more than mine? Like, we're all queuing here together. Like, why? And, they, and again, it wasn't, it wasn't even like they come and jump a little bit into the front. It's like the queue is really long and they go right to the front or right halfway. And it's like, Jesus Christ, man, complete disregard for your fellow people. And it's like, in the past, it was never like that because they always had security really kind of walking up and down the line that would check the queue and shit. I remember a few times, especially when it was really busy prior to the pandemic. But now, of course, they're probably limited resources and not a good use of their time. And also, who gives a shit? So maybe that's the, that's the case. Because in general, who gives a shit if you jump anyway? Because you still have to get you know sex at the door but i just thought that made it a quite unpleasant sort of um side of the queuing process to see so many people just deciding that you know they don't need to wait they just need to jump in front of you i thought that was fairly fairly fucked up so um keep an eye out for that if you're that kind of person again it's maybe it's a me thing i always take those things very personally i get really really angry i can lose my temper very quickly and off the back of that there's nothing more that i like than people just being unfair it's just not cool um just not cool but yeah apart from that really enjoyable experience easy to get into as per usual like i said before it's not really that big of an issue i think people online were making it more of an issue how to get in as usual it's like any other place i think in parts of western europe um covid passport id register on the place you have to basically do um you know it's kind of like you, you, you register there to basically you know say you're in the place and you've got the covid pass registered and when you leave you obviously clock out in that respect so they kind of know the numbers and whatnot and they can kind of maybe track the outbreaks you know it's a fairly simple um kind of pattern of kind of uh, going into places and then needs be um obviously once you're in there or cash um so make sure you withdraw some um fairly easy you know what i mean nothing hard to really get into too much so definitely and obviously the what is it the entry now i think it's gone up i think it's like 20 euros now right it's not 18 anymore so it's gone up to 20 re-entry fee i think it's five euros to get back in um that's for the one stamp and then you're allowed to get back in after the fact again if you want to leave again um cloakroom is about one euro fifty 
with I think a 50 euro fee 50 euro one euro fee to get your thing out if you want every time you want to get it back out um pretty easy pretty pretty standard and easy stuff pretty decent drinks menu as per usual great prices on the beers you know you know it's great sound system so i recommend you definitely check it out now if you want to go again like i said if you don't wait 17 hours in the queue then this is definitely the best time to go especially before the new year's eve um kind of madness starts but definitely go there now i definitely recommend it then the second half i want to talk about the lineup specifically that i went to go when i went to burkheim panorama bar right so i was meant to go to the week before the week before lineup was stupid like really really stupid good you know gerd jansen um who else was playing actually let, let me let me get it up on here let me get it up on here let me get it up on here let me put this on the big screen so you can see it so this is what it did. this is obviously the night that i went to um saturday the 6th of november um, Bergheim obviously had Nice Sears, Ben Clock, Dax J, Stephanie Sykes, Nojeba, and Steffi. And then Panama Bar, you had Luigi De Venier, Massimilio Pellegrini, and Bo and Boak Maker, Andy Bo Maker, Mystery Affair, Virginia, and Jennifer Cardini. But the one that I really went to go to that I missed out on because there was a real a bit of a conflict at work with my kind of holiday dates and whatnot and other people went to go at the same time which was a killer but again these things happen it is what it is everyone kind of wants to go away the same sort of time you're feeling a little bit disgruntled you want to get a break da, 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 da. i can't understand it but the one i really went to go to was this one it was i think the last month of october that lineup was crazy good and i think that also coincided with some other parties that were going on in berlin of course during halloween weekend so really great one but this is the one i wanted to go to this one here this one was the fucking bomb one that was definitely the one i kind of missed out on and i'm really really pissed but again a lot of these people are locals so there's probably going to be a great there's probably going to be um a great chance you'll probably be able to see them again some other time so this was um saturday the 30th of october the lineup was chris cedar playing burger and main room matrix man nanny h faddy mohem um baker barker sorry luke slater and rodhad and then the panorama bar you had fka the m4a who i discovered on hall you had cynthia palm tracks more alien room and flugel and gerd jansen closing like absolutely solid lineup where i've listened to you know each of these people's sets on my phone you know many many a time so that was obviously something i'd bummed out about but you know as a makeup as a backup this isn't a bad lineup to go and kind of see right not you're not going to kind of begrudge the lineup of people you want to go see so all in all, um, when I arrived, I missed Natty Sears and Ben Clock. I just arrived just after Ben Clock actually finished. So I got in about what? Yeah, just arrived. So I arrived at seven, got in a half eight. Yeah, so I missed Ben Clock. Um, and then I also missed Luigi de Vernier and Massimilio Pellegrini pagliara but i also got to saw and boy camera from the start basically into the middle, then jump back into Dax J, went back and forth for a bit, right? Um, first of all, the good and ND ball maker was fantastic like really really controlled that room from the beginning to end it was great to see somebody playing that panorama bar and also kind of um slipping in some kind of bergheim type sounds in there right there was a lot of kind of um i don't know stuff that sounded like it was 130 ish up going in terms of bpm because if you want to talk about bpms you'd say panorama bar is like 90 to 129 and then bergheim is 129 bpm to anything above you know to about 160 whatever it may be but it was good to hear him play little stuff a little bit more faster that was in there um i felt like he controlled the room really well um it looked like he had a lot of friends in there that were kind of there to kind of for moral support which always kind of helps with the atmosphere i think a lot of friends and family there kind of you know really having a good time and raving and bringing him copious amounts of cigarettes and drinks and shit so he was actually having a blast i got to briefly say you know thanks for playing amazing music which i think you should also say as a note if you do bump into artists or DJs that you like keep it brief don't talk don't give me a life story don't show them stuff on your phone just keep it nice and brief like hey appreciate what you do keep doing your thing your legend that set was amazing or if you want to pick out a specific beat a specific section a specific section sorry um, maybe you want to ask them for a track id cool but keep it very very brief i try and keep it less than a minute and just kind of keep it moving and um, we don't want to be the kind of hanger on us there you know you, the last thing you want is to be the person that's trying to extract something for free like oh, i want to get on your list oh, i want to be a friend oh, can you add me on instagram no, no, no you don't need to do that just let them know acknowledge face to face that hey i really appreciate that that was a really good set really really put a smile on my face thank you so much I'm gonna I'm gonna go to sleep happy now. Oh yeah, thank you, man. I'm I'm glad you came. Boom, 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 boom. That's it. We keep moving. So that was great. He seemed like a really cool dude, which I'm I wasn't surprised about. Again, from reading interviews of him, um, he seems like a pretty solid, um, decent lad. So that was nice to see. Then the bad. 
has to be Dax J in the main room. Um, I'm not too sure about what you guys think, but Dax J was very, very disappointing, I thought. Kind of incredibly underwhelming. Um, more so because of what I've heard of him on sets online and what I've seen obviously from streams and shit. Um, he did seem a little bit special. He did seem he had like, you know, sometimes some DJs come along who just seem to have the little, they seem to have the little bit of magic stardust on them. Because again, I've always said before, DJing isn't that difficult. I do it myself um, to whatever level that I do it at. And I think some people kind of overcomplicate things, but there are people that come along sometimes in, in life who just are a bit special. Um, people that you can't necessarily put your finger on why they're a bit special but they just have that bit of magic stardust on them and it's even more evident in the field like DJing because it's so easy to do that when someone is special it's quite clear that they're special and I thought Dax J was that special guy his productions from his DJing style like just you know there's something about his overall look there's something about him that would may separate him but it feels like to me maybe again bad observation but it feels like maybe the time that he spent in this kind of business techno field because it feels like he's kind of been flirting with that scene and playing some gigs here and there that you kind of look at you think huh what's that shit playing there right I think Rod had had this bit had a period too where he was kind of flirting with that bit because you know again he is a person that could easily play those big awakening stages and absolutely smash them so I get the allure but I think overall what it might have done it might have inflated his bank balance I'm pretty sure um brand deals and all that good stuff but I think artistically it is definitely dulled his senses it feels like because he sounded incredibly i won't say uninspired but it just sounded flat it sounded kind of like he was going through the motions it kind of sounded like he had played a variation of that set you know 32 times somewhere else uh, you know around the european circuit which is understandable right when you get into the entire field of that business techno scene you know you, you get many many a gigs that's probably why people do it because the money is really good you're playing all the time nondescript italian french you know mainland um, what you call it um uh, middle of Europe kind of sets and places, right? Eastern Europe, you're playing all these weird, weird places, but you're always getting booked. You're always getting a good fee. You get looked after most of the time and you have a ravaged, you know, basically crowd that are just hungry to just record clips of you playing and upload it on their Instagram. So it's quite gratifying in that respect, but artistically it does do something to you, I think, because you're, you're just in the in, in the grind, you're in the rat, you're in the rat rule. So you're very unlikely, I, I guess, to be spending your time in your hotel room digging for new tunes. Whatever worked for you in Bergamo you're probably going to start doing in Napoli whatever worked for you in Bordeaux you're probably going to do when you get to Krakow do you know what I mean why not because you're literally not even there for more than 12 hours so it makes more sense to just keep continuing copy and paste copy and pasting and I found for myself the only time that I did start to get better at DJing was obviously when I started to play more regularly and also when I tried to challenge myself to play a completely different set every time that I played out. Of course, I'd have some elements that I wanted to keep track of, like, you know, some some maybe combos of peak tracks that worked well. But in terms of beginning and end, I wanted it always to be different, always kind of to freshen up a little bit. And that's challenging. It's hard. It takes a lot out of you because you have to listen to music. You have to kind of get it all tagged up in your library. You have to organize it into subfolders and shit. It takes a lot of work to do that. Uh, but the easiest way to do it is just to kind of get a bang and set and just kind of rinse and repeat and maybe change some tunes here and there so i did feel like dax j was incredibly flat incredibly uninspired um somewhat boring um and it was kind of more evident when the likes of stephanie sykes and Noah jabba came on after the fact right they completely outshone him like completely like the difference in quality the difference in tempo the difference in um, just vibe overall was amazing, and even the the, the thing that Dex Chase did as well that was that was funny. He was doing those kind of big room Carl Cray, Carl Cox, sorry, not Carl Cray, Carl Cox style, um, you know, breaks breakdowns on his um, tunes as well. There's a lot of that. I was thinking, what is this? Is this flipping Charlotte the Wit? Like, I, I was confused. I didn't really get what was going on there. But again, um, Stephanie Sykes, No Jabba incredible back-to-back -back. i think that might have been one of the standout sort of like back-to-back -back sets um in terms of one after the other they were obviously sick there really enjoyed that um virginia in flipping um panorama bar was fucking incredible um it doesn't need to be said but it does need to be said in one way she does look incredibly different in real life like way more attractive in real life than in pictures which is mad doesn't need to be said but she played loads of classic hits um i was singing my heart out to fucking um 
Midnight Magic uh, Beam Me Up remix. I don't know which one she played, but I was flipping, screaming my heart out after that when that was coming on. So that was absolutely great to see. Um, I, I, didn't, I think I missed Jennifer Cardini because I left about, I'm going to say 7 p.m. or something around that kind of lark. I ended up leaving because, you know, I was just kind of knackered from all the other events that I'd gone to tr- throughout that weekend. But overall, a fairly decent night, I thought, in general. Again, um, it's always good to be reminded of the levels when it comes to um, DJs when it comes to club nights in general it's always good to be reminded right of the levels and i think that's a good thing about going to burkhan in that respect i would say maybe post pandemic it probably doesn't have the same punch as it did before because i think from nowadays i'm not sure about you guys but i've kind of learned how to love my own city a lot more i've kind of learned how to love my own home my own friends right that in my vicinity um and to do more with what i already have than try and seek other things because again we've been limited with our other things that we can do and now i'm not really longing to go to these places as much as i was in the past before these were like the major parts of my year they were kind of the ones that set the tone the ones that maybe made up for a shitty year here back home but we've had so many great parties here in london so many great parties here in the uk overall that have kind of been to club nights and shit and places reopening up that there doesn't really need to there's not a real big desire to keep going to these places all the time i'm still gonna go because again i still think it's good to be reminded of the levels there's been much there's kind of levels to all these sort of things and bergen still kind of again occupies the top of that kind of food chain in terms of consistently being able to book great people and putting on great nights overall and again just in terms of the overall experience once you're in it's fucking fantastic it's always good to go it's always good to be in a club where everyone is majority for, for the for the majority of the people that are in there they're all dancing that's always a great reminder of like oh this is what clubbing is meant to be like right everyone's going crazy tops off you know shaking their red dairy ears and just fucking going for it no one cares about what you're wearing what you look like they're just flipping dancing in the dark and getting sweaty and enjoying every piece of it so that is fantastic and there's a real lack of people staring at the dj and shit it's just a real cool thing vibe anyway all that is really really good but there's not the calling the desire to go there as much as it was previously it's just not the same thing because again the world has changed things are different people are enjoying where they are a lot more and i'm doing the same with myself going forward and again like i said before the whole queuing thing and knocking selectors can you know it can leave a sour taste in the mouth when you're the one that gets in because it feels as if like you know really it's just a club right Do you know what i mean but we get it in the end of it we get it so again great night really enjoyed it um don't have any, any complaints really in that regard what else was it occurred saw some people that i've recognized from here and they're out and about out in out there but you know the, there's no real need to kind of you know do all that kind of introductions in those kind of places you don't know where people's heads are at and whatnot so that is one thing you left it to the side but all in all really great night really enjoyed it um i'll say probably standout set that i'll kind of go to maybe virginia in terms of getting me up and down because i was absolutely losing my mind off of that set really really fucking enjoyed it and then of course second would be my guy nd Bo- uh, ball maker bow maker ball maker bow maker have you pronounced that i think he did really well too amazingly so yeah really really enjoyed it really great night really recommend if you haven't been before that you do check it out because again it's still one of the best club clubbing experiences that you could ever go to especially if you're not you know aware of all these things that we do or if you're not aware of the scene in general you want to be reminded of why, why these places are highly rated definitely that's a good place to go i definitely recommend it why is this thing going so slow in the moment i don't know why but anyway let's move on what else we want to talk about bah, 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 bah. um then i quickly 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 wanted to touch upon the night i went to on saturday right on saturday i ended up going to a place called paloma it is a paloma bar which is in cop tour it's the main sort of station i guess that people go to when they want to go to burger because it's sort of like in the center of all the kind of hip kind of places maybe in their example it could be their shortage or maybe their brick lane i'm not sure how you describe it but next to there is where the burger meister is a really kind of well-known you know burger place that they have there in berlin really nice maybe some people say it's overrated but i still think it's consistently one of the best burgers that you can get over there fairly well priced all is well done depending on the lo- dip, uh, independent of the location and right next to it around the corner sort of there's this great club called paloma bar which i've never actually been to prior to prior experiences because i just never got around to go in there but this time i thought you know what because there was this night called powerhouse um which is um started up by finn johansson who's got this blog that i've been reading for you know many 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 years a blog that I kind of kind of follow definitely check it out he had a night where you had soundstream DJ Pete with him playing and obviously I wanted to go check that out 
So I went on a Saturday and this basically made up the majority of my club. No, no, that this basically set the tone, I think, for the clubbing experience over the weekend. I stayed until 10 in the morning, ended up going to some random Irish dude's um, house party uh, afters, uh, in the after effect, which kind of turned into a bit of a dud because, you know, it's interesting that after hours can turn into a dud when the host that you're going to go see is very controlling of the music. That's just one thing that just sets off in a bad mood. You know, sometimes you go to after hours and the guy's like, yeah, just just jump on my Spotify or use my YouTube or everyone just opens a new tab and writes a song they want to play. He was just not wanting anyone to play what they wanted. He just kind of kept controlling the, the flipping the flipping tunages and that kind of set off in a bad light. And then after the fact, everyone kind of just got off the point and I just wanted to move on. So whatever. The night itself, the bias itself. Paloma Bar was number, I would say, up there with Roses, which is obviously in Berlin too, and maybe 8mm Bar. They're definitely two of the places that if I had my own club owned by, that's what I would want them to look like. Like 100% in terms of the capacity, in terms of the design, the layout, perfect place. I think the actual clubbing bar landscape thing probably is about 100 people deep, if that. And then the, the other bar downstairs is probably 100 people deep as well. So it's like 200 maybe in the entire venue. But they have a banging sound system. Um, the DJ booth is like running shoot. You can see everyone playing what they're doing and shit. It's just a really, 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 really nice space. I can't really say anything bad about it at all. The only other thing issue is that they didn't accept NHS COVID passes there. So they did make a bit of a stink about it, but they did let me in after the fact but it did let me know hey you have to go to the pharmacy and get uh, basically an eu pass i think the system is when you go to a pharmacy they have a system and again it's free but you have to kind of make sure you're polite about it because it's not something that you know it's just it's entitled over to you but if if they've got the time and they're free they can basically convert your nhs pass into a eu covid pass so you basically get to use that to know to kind of go into venues especially club spaces because usually most of them um, want you to have a covid pass when you go in so that's a new entry requirement you need but after that they kind of let me in not too much bother then i think it was 10 euros or something to get in i think so around that mark maybe three euros or two euros for the uh, cloakroom which is always a good thing Coming from London again, I'm not sure about you guys, but coming from London, usually we avoid putting our cloaks, coats in the cloakroom, either by keeping it on us or by not bringing the coat in the first place. Because the winters in Berlin are really, really harsh, I wouldn't advise not bringing a coat. And I would advise if you're going to go, especially with the amount of alcohol and maybe drugs you might consume, definitely try and make sure you put your coat in a cloakroom before you do anything else. Just do that first. I really recommend it because you might think there's loads of little nooks and crannies you can put your stuff in and usually people are okay with it. There's not security guards on the dance floor flicking their lights on and off and making you feel uncomfortable. So you can do what you want basically on the dance floor. But you do sometimes lose um which I know I did, you lose your um, understanding of space and time. So it's really nice when at the end of the time, when you're kind of panicking, thinking with my jacket, and you're like, oh yeah, I put it in the cloak room and all your stuff is in there. It does fill your heart with absolute joy. So definitely make sure you do that regardless of the price. And usually the price ain't that much. It's usually never more than three euros. Um, and it's always kind of really well organized. If they, have to, if they don't have too much space, they won't, they won't let you put your coat in there. So it's just really well done. That aside, the night itself was fucking fantastic. Um, I unfortunately arrived just after um, Soundstream had played. He literally walked past me in the queue. Um, you know, I got to say hi to him briefly as he left. Um, but then I then go, got to see DJP and, and Flint Vin Johansson go back to back. And it was great, man. Like, I, I don't know. Maybe it's just because of the fact that it was a more of a house night, house and disco type of vibe that I got to hear different type of music being played in berlin like on a kind of nighttime basis like in a in a nightclub for sure because you do hear different types of music being played when you go to like a bar um someone's putting a playlist on you might hear some rock you might hear some inter alternative bit indie a bit of ebm cool but for the most part you only hear techno so when you go to a nightclub that happens to play stuff that is a techno more on the housey side of things more on the disco side of things indie dance side of things it is really really good um the bar is great um every bartenders were super attentive and, and full for and shit um the layout's quite interesting you go to the, you go the main floor you kind of walk into so again this is the the gate things that you kind of walk have to walk into around the corner from Bergamaisa. you walk up the stairs you walk up another set of stairs you queue up for a bit you go in pay at a little kiosk you walk up some stairs again to go to like the one floor that's got the windows on it that one that's like the loungy sort of area but then where the actual club night is is the top floor 
So you, so there's two, four separate, which is great. So if you don't really care about who's playing upstairs, you just want to chill and have a little view of Coppa Sator and have a bit of a smoke and whatnot, you go in that kind of first floor. And then the second floor is where everything's sort of popping off on. And the layout's really cool as well. The DJ sort of sits towards the one end where next to kind of the bar area is and all the dancers and revelers are on the other end. And yeah, man, fully, fully enjoyed it. Bumped in, happened to bump into a lot of UK guys in there, um, which obviously was no surprise considering the genre of music and considering who was playing. It would be natural that a few UK guys were there. I saw a couple of dudes with some soundstream vinyls in there, wanting to get signed. So I hope, I think they did because he you know, obviously had left before I got there. But again, definitely a standout. Um, un- I'll say recently discovered gym not un, no, recently discovered gem in my book because i wasn't really familiar with paloma bar before um i obviously went in um that time because I've, I've i've kind of heard of it beforehand never really had a chance to go there because again i spent most of my time at these other sort of um venues that you everyone kind of knows and love but if you want to go somewhere a little bit different and kind of mix up your experience i definitely recommend you check it out it's definitely um a an interesting experience especially for a place that you kind of only know for playing kind of one type of music it's good to go somewhere where it's a bit different it's got a bit more of a change and a bit more of a housier vibe i really fucking enjoyed it i'm not going to lie man really bloody 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 enjoyed it um definitely recommend you check out um paloma bar out there in copper Soto, well next to copper Soto station they're saying here it's in kreuzberg i'm not sure if they would you count that as kreuzberg i guess you probably would i'm not too sure how you classify the areas but you know what i mean definitely recommend you check it out if you haven't before um again powerhouse is definitely a decent lineup because again Finn Johansson's got a lot of kind of clout in that industry and um, he ends up booking some really great people I think they said it's going to be the last one for a while um, if I'm not mistaken he does recall them all and put them on his SoundCloud so definitely check that out if you haven't before um, yeah definitely a good like, party to go to overall definitely enjoyed it definitely definitely enjoyed it uh, what else we talk about now but don't want to waste too much more of your time here but 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 yeah, we'll talk briefly about this because obviously this has been the major news that's been happening over the last kind of week or so the flipping tragedy that happened at Astro World Travis Scott's festival where unfortunately it looks like at the latest count eight people have passed away um due to overcrowding due to it yeah, would say mostly overcrowding mostly overcrowding um and just kind of negligence from the event organizers and maybe from Travis in some respects and this is a short video here courtesy of um, inside edition kind of outlining exactly what went on kind of giving an overview and towards the end i'll kind of share with you some of my thoughts and feelings about the entire thing and then we can kind of maybe give a shout out to some of the people that unfortunately or shout out recognize some of the people that unfortunately had passed away and maybe catch up on some other kind of not so savory details of the story going forward but this is a clip courtesy of news edition sorry inside edition detailing what went on giving you a brief timeline of the events The mayhem at Astro World began hours before Tra- Travis Scott took the stage. 2 p.m., hundreds of fans stampede across a parking lot. They easily pushed down chain link. Come on, man. Okay, let's let it reload one second. Bear with me. I've got the slowest MacBook in the world, you know the vibes. Down chain link fences and storm <laughs> into the venue. Yes, sir! Hundreds more storm. Oh, it's not having is it? It's not having it. Storm through the VIP security gate. <laughs> Even deputies on horseback couldn't bring the chaos under control. Back up, back up. KT. KTV reporter Micah Hatfield was there. Her crew shot the extraordinary footage. For we cover violent situations all the time, but that felt like like something that was a next level uh, for us. It was scary, I was shaking. I told my photographer, I have a feeling something bad is gonna happen, but never could I have imagined that it would have been this.
Houston Police Chief Troy Finner was also worried and says he met with the singer and conveyed concerns about the energy in the crowd. 9.06 p.m. Okay, okay. Travis Scott starts his performance. His girlfriend Kylie Jenner, their three-year-old daughter Stormy, and Kendall Jenner watch from a VIP booth. The crowd includes other young children like this little type. Trouble begins almost immediately. Yeah. 9-11 p.m. Thousands of fans rush to get closer to the stage, crushing fans up front. There is panic as some fans try to escape over security barriers. Travis Scott, unaware of the impending doom, pumps up the crowd. I want to see some rages, man. Who want to rage, man? 9.30 p.m. Medics in a golf cart try to make their way through the throng. CPR is being performed on one of the victims. <laughs> 9.34 p.m., a hero emerges. Concert goer Sienna McCarty, a senior at Texas A&M, pleads with the cameraman to help her get the concert stopped. A young man joins her. Others in the crowd chant the same desperate message. 9.38 p.m., a mass casualty event is declared. Uh, folks are coming out of the crowd complaining of difficulty breathing. Um, crushing back injuries. Seems like the crowd is depressing. I can tell. Intensive care nurse Madeline Eskins passed out in the crush, but the moment she recovered, she began helping others. Well, so you couldn't move, you couldn't turn your head, you couldn't lift your arms up. It was absolute. It was like hell. Four or five people in front of me were getting cardiac arrest. This was appalling. 9.42 p.m. Travis Scott stops performing for a few moments as an injured fan is treated. We need somebody to help him. Somebody passed out right here. That person ended up dying, you know? I think that person that he's talking about in that in the crowd. Oh, this video, man. The computer's going mad right now. It's not having it. Watches as the unconscious fan is passed over people's heads before continuing to perform. Outside the venue, fleets of fire trucks and ambulances are on the scene, but the band plays on for 37 minutes. Travis Scott later posted this video. Worst apology ever. Sorrow and Worst concern. apology ever. Like a white filter. I could never imagine anything like this just happening. My fans really mean the world to me. Kylie no, Jenner, you're lying. Who's pregnant, posted, We weren't aware of any fatalities until the news came out after the show, and in no world would have continued filming or performing. 10 15 p.m. The last song is sung, but it's too late. Eight are dead and 25 hospitalized. So, obviously, you know, not good stuff whatsoever. So, kind of to cover over it again the video was jittery so please forgive me for the buffering of the video but you know my computer is struggling for life right now it is what it is i guess in the long and short of it no one would sense is probably sitting here blaming travis scott for all what that occurred on that fateful night right on that unfaithful night on that flipping tragic night no one's accusing him of the fact but he did contribute obviously to it in some extent because once it was known that people were passing out to that extent, especially, you know, usually at these festivals, there's always somebody on the ground that has maybe a line to other people. There's always a chain of command, but a way to kind of report what's going on right on the ground. It might not, it might take a while to get to the person that makes the decisions, but there's always a person that can kind of relay things back, right? And maybe after the gates got stormed, you still don't think it's going to be that crazy because that happens at every single Travis Scott show, right? People storm the gates, see festival pictures of, of other people storming gates, other people's shows. It happens quite often. These kids get too excited and they want to be viral. They take pictures of themselves storming gates. They run over. Cops chase them. It's all it's all part of the fun and game of them kind of going out nowadays, right? It's a bit silly because obviously it can, it can be tragic, but you get why some kids want to do that sort of stuff. Fair. But then once you know that in the event itself with the energy and the excitement of the crowd that things are happening really bad at the actual show he should have took it within his own self to maybe pause it for a prolonged period of time or cancel it at that point some would say he couldn't because of apple da, 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 but in that occasion considering how many people that were there i think they said it was 50 50 000 plus maybe more because obviously it was way over capacity because people stormed the gates and they couldn't get those people out after the fact if it was maybe close to 100 000 he should have paused it for a considerable time to make sure the crowd calmed down to make sure the medical services could get the people out that needed to help and that would have maybe 
Again, if buts or maybes, we don't know, but I'm sure that could have contributed to maybe limiting the amount of hospitalization and maybe even the amount of deaths going forward. But continuing on with the show, which inevitably led people to be more boisterous and whatever it may be, is kind of what contributed to this kind of tragic event now at the moment where we have, you know, eight people dead and counting, right? Because I think there's a couple of people now on, on life support and shit, which is just a tragic, tragic, tragic story. And then again, off the back of it, Obviously, families are now kind of hitting Astro World with lawsuits and stuff. I think here it says it's lawsuits are hit up to 19, with most naming Travis Scott as the defendant. It says the accuracy of Rolling Stone. The flood of the lawsuits stemming from the Friday night fatal Astro World crowd control disaster, top 19. As of Monday, all named concert producers and Live Nation as one of the lead defendants, with most going after Travis Scott. Festival goer Christian Priorities is seeking at least a 1 million from the Live Nation, and even Drake in one of the suits that Legend Drake joins to as a surprise. I guess on stage and helped inside the crowd to a level that was out of control. Per, um, Paredes um, was at the front of the general admission section and felt immediate push when Scott took the stage at 9 p.m. and was severely injured in a stampede that ensued and nine page lawsuit states, right? So obviously all that stuff's happening and then tragically you've got this which kind of details the the victims obviously of the of the Astro World catastrophe again, all really, really, really really incredibly incredibly young college students and stuff you got a guy here called Fred Franco Pinto Franco Pin Franco Patino 21 a senior from the University of Dayton Ohio that passed away you've got a kid here called John Helger um 14 years old Jesus Christ uh Brianna Rodriguez 16 You've got Rudy Pina, 23, Danish. Again, people that you would assume would be Travis Scott fans, right? All within their kind of early 20s, young teens, right? Um, late teens, so just absolutely Travis. Alice Acosta, the kid before that was Jacob E. Jur Jurinic. Like, really tragic, eh? Madison Dubisky. And then to make it matters even worse, to make matters even worse, you've got this tragic story. Which is just, you know, tragic. It says, Astro World tried to lose a nine-year-old with major organ damage, brain swelling, family says, right? A nine-year-old is fighting for his life following the deadly chaos of the Travis Scott Astro World, which left eight people dead. Now his family are joining away with a lawsuit being filed. Um, Ezra Blount went to the concert NRG and hosted him with his father and was on his father's shoulders when a crowd surge began, elder's grandparents told. So he dropped from his father's shoulders, got crushed, and he filed to pick his... <laughs> Ezra was separated from his father and his grandparents said that they found him alone in the hospital in a coma, suffering from major organ damage and brain swelling. Jesus Christ. They basically got stepped all over on. And basically, maybe, if you think about it, maybe he's only survived to this extent because he's so young, right? Like, he's small, innocent child. Ezra Grandpa said he didn't deserve it. He didn't deserve it at all. He's just coming into town to see one of his favorite artists and to be trampled like that and really left that hospital with no one knowing where he was. That's heartbreaking. So, nine-year-old kid. And then we've got, lastly, this story. I think these are two people on life support I've seen so far, which is why some people are saying the numbers are being underreported because allegedly there's a lot more people that have kind of died associated with the festival that people don't really want to name. I don't know what's going on, but it's a lot of crazy shit. It says here, Texas A&M student has no brain activity after being injured at Astro's World Festival. It says here, 22-year-old Texas A&M student or senior has shown no brain activity. Uh, Bariti Shahahini has been critical condition and is on a ventilator. Her family told ABC Tuesday morning that they're, they're meeting to determine what to do next. So basically brain dead for to what i can see here shahini and her sister um narata shahini and her cousin mohit belani went to the concert together but lost each other when the crowd surged once one person fell people started toppling like dominoes it was like a sinkhole people were falling on top of each other Bel Be belani said there were like layers of bodies on the ground like two people thick we were fighting to come up at the top and breathe and stay alive Barati was taken to Houston methodologist hospital by ambulance paramedics gave a CPR on the way but Nahati Sahini and Bellini had both lost their cell phones they couldn't find Barati once once we let go of her hand next time we saw her we were in the ER Jesus Christos and again the Sabbath God found me for the, for the young ladies also if you want to contribute to that then I'll leave that link as well in the show note description for you to contribute to Bar, uh, Bar uh, how do you, I think you pronounce it Bar, Barhati Shahini's Asher World Recovery Fund. You know, cute girl now has been basically left completely brain dead after just going to an attend the concert. So, as much as people want to say that hey, it's not Travis Scott's fault, yes, for sure it isn't, but the lack of regard. Um, for his fan safety during the show is definitely evident especially now people are posting up clips of all these other musicians from various different genres making it uh, making a real effort to pause the show and to calm down a crowd when they get too rowdy i think this is in everyone's interest even in a 
flipping DJ world that I'm in, right? Techno world. When a crowd gets too crazy, sometimes the promoter will tell the DJ to basically play something to like calm the crowd down, like basically a a what they call it, um, a crowd cleanser, uh, a dance floor like when you want to clear the dance floor right to kind of get the crowd or to kind of recalibrate everything in terms of a mood people do that all the time in dj um in the dj world so for travis to make no effort to calm the crowd down and to really take prolonged breaks to do it is really kind of unsettling people coming out and saying that he couldn't because apple told him he had to stream which was crazy because in the end they did get a full show apple did get a full show in the end they went to stream a full show and they got a full show so maybe that was the whole extent of it then of course i think if i'm not mistaken this girl or somebody or the Barishi Sahini girl, she might have been the one because there's the videos and images of a girl that gets taken out of the crowd. The security team drops her on her head, right? Accidentally. They pick her back up again. And then a couple of minutes later, that same, where they are standing, where they pick that girl up, um, Kylie Jenner and Kendall kind of walk through there with their VIP guests that they kind of come through. That's when they leave. So it's kind of just, it goes to show in it. It's just, a, it's just bad optics, right? In terms of people are dying in a, in a general admission crowd, but then the VIPs have, to, you know, basically get given a clear passage to get back to their kind of motorcades and go back home in complete safety again not their fault but it's just the optics of it just look really terrible again travis scott's apology was probably the worst i've ever seen um doing a black and white filter video with that kind of fake distress rubbing on his face was bizarre why you couldn't just sit in front of a camera just talk really plainly and openly to his fans about what happened and just say what he can do what he, he's going to do what he needs whatever it takes to kind of rectify this issue was out of the bat. I don't know why he didn't do that. The statement and the notes app was already classless. Then the video with the black and white filter, I just, I don't know. Sometimes I worry for these people uh, when it comes to their lack of flipping soul and whatnot. But again, man, like another stark reminder, I think overall as to how, I don't say dangerous it is in these festivals. Another maybe stark reminder about like who you, like picking your, basically your heroes very carefully. That's a very, maybe that's a lesson in this, in that kind of stock reminder. Pick your heroes carefully, pick your events carefully too, because this is a newly founded sort of festival. It's not something that's been kind of um, honed and sort of perfected over the years. We have a lot of complaints about some festivals in terms of the sound, in terms of lack of flipping toilets and shit and maybe drinking stations. But one thing you can't say about most festivals that you go to, especially some of the established ones, that people just don't just die because of crowd, you know, uh, you know, not adequate crowd control they might die because of you know bad drugs they might have taken again your own responsibility you ingested that shit again you shouldn't maybe the security should be or the people in the venue should be limiting those kind of bad drugs that come in but again it is a there's a part of personal responsibility in that regard but no one dies through bad crowd control most of the festivals most of the top festivals um not, not not to this level anyway so for them to do to this level obviously shows in some respects some poor organization and safety protocols were obviously put in place and then of course the musician himself didn't help matters he didn't try and stem the hype he didn't try and calm it down there's also footage of him talking in previous previous times about how much he likes the carnage and the rage and all that shit and now it's coming back to bite him in it is what it is um whether or not this will impact him overall i very much doubt it um i am interested to see what companies like nike do when it comes to his collaboration will they pause him will they delay them probably not but the un you know the uh the sad part about it is most likely that will definitely add to the value of the shoes that will definitely make the shoes way more popular than what they are now because they're going to be shoes that you know won't be ever to be ever made again it's like the young was it ace abari when he got in tr trouble for that sexual stuff when you know that video came out of him taking off the duvet off that girl in a hotel they cancel his nike deal or cancel his nike air force that was meant to come out but then the ones that were around ended up tripling up in value because they were basically rare right there's no more of them they didn't, they didn't ever come out as a gr as they didn't ever come out to the general public in that respects so as bad as this may be for him in terms of reputation it's going to be good for the value of the brand overall and the value of the shoes because they're definitely going to shoot up and for in general you know nike you know doesn't strike me as the most ethical or moral company in the world so they're going to just do what they need to be done to kind of get their shoes out um and yeah his career one stuff i think his fans that still love him will still end up going you know copying tickets and shit i don't think that's going to hamper things it might just be a question of the partners that he's in partnership with when it comes to producing his shows putting on putting on his gigs producing his festivals you know brand deals and stuff because it's not a partnership that he has he's probably the most brand friendly um rapper out there which maybe is a major hit that's going to be on him because he's so controlling of how he's 
images. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He doesn't really talk to media too much. Um, he's he, they only put out certain bits of promo information or material for him into the media. Before that, he was doing loads of charity shit. You saw him doing some stuff in the park with some kids. I forgot what that was about. So there's there's a very much calculated effort behind Travis to present him a certain way. And obviously, the the bad thing about that is once something goes wrong. There's not a lot of material. There's not a lot for people to kind of hank run and say you're a good dude because you've spent so much time cultivating and crafting an image that people are now going to suddenly slap that as part of your personality, which may maybe not, but you know, couple that with the whack apologies and all that shit and the offer to pay for the funeral, which is in part with you bet better help and shit. I don't know. There's really loads of really scummy stuff that's happening in general overall going around it. But again, it's not totally his fault, but he's definitely partly to blame. And in these instances, when people's lives are basically being lost, unfortunately, someone has to pay. Um, whether it's going to be Live Nation or it's going to be him, someone will pay in the end of it. It just is a matter of fact. I think um, if this festival would have went off without a hitch and was successful, he would have got all the... It wouldn't have been Live Nation getting all the accolades, right? It would be Travis getting all the accolades and his group, his Cactus Jack, whatever production team, whatever they're called. They'd be getting all the accolades. They'd be getting all the love, right? Oh my God, Travis has created one of the biggest festivals in the world. It was, you know, well sold out. The kids will have fun. Look all these great reviews we're getting, blah, 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 blah. So remember, things go wrong. You then can't shun responsibility because if you wanted to, you love when it was going well, you also have to receive the love when it goes bad. So that's just the game. And that's what it is. But again, force and feelings go out of everybody that was injured and, you know, suffered from the back of this hopefully this is a lesson learned that we don't kind of repeat these mistakes again going forward but you know that's why we have to we always have to give credit to people like Tyler the Creator as well and maybe even the Playboy Kai they have similar sort of fans right in terms of their um the, their kind of uh, craziness with like, having shows and even Tyler to a certain extent he's kind of dumbed he's kind of really slowed down even ASAP Rocky in no respect ASAP Mob they used to jump into crowds and fight people so you have to give those guys a lot of credit for getting to a point where they kind of changed how they were on stage and maybe re-educated their fan base because I think you do have to do that you do have to kind of teach your fans how to enjoy your music or how to communicate with you online or how to behave in general when it comes to representing you as a fan whatnot and they've done a good job at doing that um they haven't continued this kind of rage mosh because that's a big thing in hip-hop for a while everyone's trying to create mosh pits right um but they slowly moved away from that and kind of just you know went about putting on a good show having it be well attended having it be a diverse crowd celebrating that respect all that kind of good stuff and it's kind of changing again basically rookie used to be swinging people in, in the crowd now he's on stage kind of collecting bras and shit you know i mean it's sort of changed over the over the over the years and you have to give those guys credit because you know you don't hear of many deaths happening at those ghost festivals or concerts and shit so credit to them going forward but again rip to all the all those kids that were lost man literal kids there's a nine-year-old kid on life support and people are talking about whether or not it's travis scott's fault or not it's like at this point you should accept responsibility if you have somebody that has principles and you have morals right you should just accept it yeah all responsibility fuck it um because you can't live with yourself but the fact that the people are trying to palm you blame off to other people you know there's supposedly there's a story about people getting injected with some sort of substance that's making them go crazy i don't know all these really weird distractions are going on all to kind of um subvert blame and shit um you got chloe kardashian over there posting first traps and doing her thing you know what i mean everyone's kind of everyone's trying to divert people's attention but let's just focus on the families focus on the victims focus on trying to find out exactly what her, what went on what occurred who's to blame and then try and go from there because you know until people have someone to blame and someone they can rest assured is going to pay in some respect it's kind of difficult to even start the grieving process you know which is obviously going to be difficult because all these people all had their lives ahead of them they all went to a concert they didn't go to nothing crazy you know you don't expect to have received a call that you're kid is in a coma after the back of going to a concert jeremy just doesn't make any sense but yeah um r.i.p to the lost r.i.p to the lost anyway that is the show episode number 515 thanks again for tuning in sorry to end on such a somber note but i had to kind of get that one out there before i moved on if it's your first time tuning to a show via youtube you know what to do smash like hit subscribe and comment down below if you're listening via the podcast app please leave me a five star review and share the show with your friends and of course support the patreon too at patreon.com for just agostino i'll be grateful for your support and again i'll be posting some extra rated content on there very very soon so basically make sure you jump on board there but no that'll be out there by the end of the week or maybe today actually i'll do it today i'll do it today so if you're not if you're listening to this tonight then you definitely check out the patreon for the exclusive Straight content regarding my trip to Berlin at patreon.com for just Agostino. Jump on there today, don't delay. Until then, my friends, take care and be safe.